And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the upcoming War and Aether, which we'll be which we'll be getting into at, as well as all of its in all of its insanity that it brings. Um, a man of min, a man of many colors and a, and the only man that I've had in a while who who understands the value of hot dish. The one and only Alex Zubarev. How are you doing today, man? Hello, I'm I'm doing well. How are you? I'm do, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Um, it is nice and not sunny out, so that that is an improvement for me. I'm glad we both understand the finities of the Minnesota hot dish. <laughs> yes. Um, look, I've 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 made I've made <clears throat> I've made it clear to the to those who know me. It's hot. As far as I'm concerned, it's hot dish. Anyone who says otherwise, well, it's a free country, and you are free to be wrong. <laughs> So, a bit of a tradition around here is to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. With that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Right. Um, well, uh, it uh, all comes back... Oh, yeah, yeah, we went over this once. Mm -hmm. um, it all comes down to, uh, to two things. So, uh, for one... It comes back to I've been playing video games ever since I was a kid. Mm. Like they were my pastime; they were always there for me. And I'm playing RPGs, particularly, always gave me the greatest kick. So well, I've always been playing video games as a kid, and that's where it really goes like the deepest and furthest back. Mm. Uh, tabletops specifically, uh, I got into uh, playing them for the first time towards the end of high school, and once I got into it, I immediately fell in love and just started playing it more and more, running games myself, and now I've been playing games for years and decided it's, it's time to uh, take up making my own. Can't find uh, the niche that I want to hit, so I'll just make it myself. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that kind of thing in mind, fantasy can take many different forms, obviously. I've, met, I've mentioned this in the past, and I've mentioned this on previous rants. What brand of fantasy are you bringing to the table with War and Aether? Ultimately, it's built from the core to fit into a low fantasy world where magic exists but isn't really used and spellcasters are hunted down and frowned upon. Monsters are really the thing that blows up with magic. Alchemy exists. And it's a very low fantasy world akin to the likes of The Witcher. But at the end of the day, the tabletop itself, it's its a rule book. It's a set of rules. Like, any game master who wants to take this set of rules and run it in their own high fantasy world could do so with ease. It's built from the core to be a low fantasy game, but uh, for... I'm just sitting here. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I ju you just yes. heard you pop back in. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. There was a bit of a derp moment. <laughs> Everything all good? Everything, everything's all good. Um, now, g given given that given that particular um, given that particular setup, um, since you're go since you're going with a since you're going with a low magic affair. One of the things I'm one of the things I'm curious about is in um isn't is in the core mechanic. Now 
unless I'm mistaken, unless I'm mistaken, unless unless there was some hidden text that I didn't I didn't read, you're going with a straight D twenty approach. Um, yeah. Now, this this brings me to one, this brings me to one particular question because this is something that has a whole lot of variance when it comes to how that D twenty is is utilized. Um, and that. It, and that involves the exceptional results. Um, when it comes to rolling a natural one or a natural twenty, do you consider, do you treat those as automatic, su automatic um, success and failures, respectively, or rather, rather reverse, respectively, or do you, con or do you treat those as, um, as exploding results? Um, I treat them as. Differently between combat and non-combat. In mm -hmm. combat, there are critical strikes that are based on your critical threat range on the D20. All weapons have a minimum threat range of rolling a natural 20, and you get a critical strike for extra damage. Uh, and then a critical failure, which can mean either the destruction of your weapon or just an automatic miss. Mm -hmm. uh, that's in combat. Out of combat, I don't use natural ones and natural 20s for automatic successes failures or anything of the sort because one thing that i do with my game is with the skill point system uh everything that you put points into directly affects your skill bonuses and this game can get uh, pretty high in dcs like most of the higher level dcs go up to 35 but some of them up to 50 and i like the idea that Somebody can be so skilled at a certain task that even if you do your worst job possible at it and roll a one, you still meet the bar for passing that task. Mm -hmm. You know, like uh, the idea that a absolute master crafter can't fail at making a basic dagger. Yeah. Um. And there's there's been pl there's been plenty of there's been plenty of cases of vir of virtuosos who phoned it in and still and still did a good job. Um, one could one could argue that's the case with Spielberg with the Lost World. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. But when it comes to I now I'm not gonna I'm not going to delve too hard hard into combat, but I do want I do want to get this I do want to get this um particular um base covered. Um, when it comes to crit, when it comes to critical strikes, in some ca in some cases, there's been the whole roll to confirm, and then that determines whether you do maximum damage or you do double damage. Max damage, i.e., all the die modifiers are treated as their max result. Um, or in in some cases, the whole roll to confirm is dropped, and it's just max and it's just max damage. Mm -hmm. What what um. What approach do you use with critical strikes? So there is a two-step process with critical strikes in the game. First, you roll uh, the critical threat, where if your weapon... You roll a natural 20 on your weapon, mm -hmm. and the first thing you do is you have that critical threat. That guarantees your attack hits no matter what. But in order to roll a critical strike, you have to re-roll the attack again, to roll a uh, critical strike and deal double damage. Uh, it's double dice and double flat damage. So if you did 1d6 plus 4 damage, you'd end up doing 2d6 plus 8 damage instead. Now, in the, I've seen some cases where it's, where it's just the same where it's just the same die rolled but you but you double the result and in this case you're doubling the dice and the flat numbers. Um was there a reason you had in mind for t for taking that approach? It just... Uh, I could be wrong in this, but it just seemed simpler and more straightforward in my mind that if you have times two on your critical modifier, it does times two on the numbers present. 1d6 becomes 2d6, mm -hmm. and plus four becomes plus eight. And that's just how I built the system around it. And from what I've done with testing so far with... um a particular group who is brand new to tabletops altogether, they're understanding it just fine, so I'm pretty happy with where it's at. Mm -hmm. Person personally, I can I can see a bit of wisdom in taking that route, but for a different reason. And that is um 
oddly enough, the re oddly enough, the reason why confirmation was dropped in D in the edition everyone hates but me, D and D fourth edition, and that is they wanted to avoid large damage gaps, mm -hmm. where where one where one critical can can mean can mean the can mean the difference between doing a significant amount of damage or um or KOing somebody. Yeah. And that and if you look at if you were to do the times tables when ju when just looking at the doubling of the doubling all the numbers as opposed to doing an overall doubling you ha you have far it skews far more likely to the higher end of things whereas yeah. doubling the dice you ha you have you have some opportunity for the for those dice to still Roll so, still roll somewhat lower and go and go more for death by a thousand cuts. Like yeah, in instead of do, instead of doing um instead of doing a, instead of a d8 of damage being critical as sixteen, if it's two d8, it's not guaranteed that it's going to do more damage, but there's a chance that it'll do a more reliable amount of damage. Yeah, exactly. And the other thing that I particularly like about having to uh, re-roll to confirm a critical strike is that in this game particularly, in combat, it makes defense builds a bit more viable in a sense, wherein if you have a super high defense and it's super hard to hit you, but all somebody needs to roll is a natural 20 in order to hit you no matter what, your high defense is still going to come into play into stopping that person from landing a critical strike on you. Mm -hmm. Now, let's sh let I want to shift into into character creation. Now, one of the things that you've that you very clearly advertise as a claim to fame for the game is going with a is going with a classless system. Yep. Now, Given the fact that one, given the fact that you've made it clear that um, the more traditional D twenty system served as an inspiration, what prompted you to go with a more classless approach? Uh, two things really. I had one thing um, was that I was just coming off of playing Outer Worlds, which also inspired the skill point system that exists in the game, mm -hmm. and I wanted you to be able to build your own character without locking yourself into a playstyle, being able to go from the start and, if you don't know what you want, playing around, feeling about, and seeing what you want to do later on. And the second thing was just that same essence of not locking you into a playstyle if you don't want to be a rogue or if you want to switch out from being a rogue or hybrid your builds there's no class that locks you in but also it makes it a lot simpler too mm -hmm. like when you have a class system and you're introducing brand new players to it they can get overwhelmed with how many options there are how the different classes work and play together but if you tell them here's a starter job that you are a peasant pick a job, figure the rest out later. Ends up working out a lot nicer, and then there's a lot more roleplay opportunity with that as well. When you can be a the local courtesan, the whore, who becomes the great knight and fighter of the of the ages. Well, we've well um you know, the, it's funny you mentioned that kind of thing because uh, because on the because I've been I've been reading um I've been reading The Way of Kings, the first book in the Stormlight archive and with that, you have Kaladin going from a br from a bridge crew slave up up to um, a lot more than that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm I'm vastly simplifying the matter, but I'm just using that as a um, as a case in point. Right. And that's actually another thing with this game is that one thing that I try to hit with this game is the realism aspect, both in character creation, development, and combat. And one thing that really nails that home is the idea that you aren't the hero when you start off in the game. You're not the fighter, the sorcerer, the rogue. No, you come, you start the game as an actual literal peasant, and you have to work and struggle to become that hero. Yeah. Your origin story starts with the game. Yeah, um, Warhammer Fantasy has, has attempted to do something similar to that, although... It's a little bit more extreme than what you, than what you're going with, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, 
Now, when it now when it comes to now obviously when it comes to the prof, when it comes to the professions that's a it, that's a um start that's a starting package essentially. Yeah. And I did notice that that there are more advanced versions of those pa of those packages. One thing I'm one thing I'm curious about is do you plan when it comes to when it comes to the advanced professions do you plan on having multiple tiers of them or it or is it or is it just a basic and advanced dichotomy uh, a basic advanced dichotomy so how it works is the professions are what you start with mm -hmm. and they give you a myriad of bonuses to different skills then at every 10th level you can either pick up a new profession to get more bonuses or you can pick up an advancement advancements give you less skill bonuses but they're more focused into a particular niche that that advancement is better suited toward and advancements are also where you get more of the traditional tabletop class abilities you know things being able to uh take damage for a nearby ally or change the type of damage that allies can do when you're a bard mm -hmm. and there's no technical level cap to the game uh, generally, after level 20, support for higher levels gets uh, looser and looser, but there isn't a official level cap. You can just keep going, keep playing at, at every 10th level, pick up a new advancement or a new profession, and pick up something to add to your arsenal. All right. Now, when it comes when it comes to the when it comes now when it comes to some of the some of the um, advancements that you can get. We've are, we we kind of hinted at the fact that uh, it seems a lot of the advancing that you're going to be doing, the bulk of it as you level up, is going to be on skill points, and mm -hmm. um get and um some and that brings me to the talent system that you have, which I don't think it would be far off for me to say that talents are semi analogous to feats, just with far easier chains. Looking straight at you, looking straight at you, whirlwind strike from Pathfinder. <laughs> I, yeah, I no, one hundred percent. The talent system, talents are the equivalent of feats in uh, Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder, mm -hmm. but talents you acquire with every five skill points, not a total bonus, but skill points that you gain from leveling up, invested into any general or combat skill. Each skill has four talents, up to 20 skill points invested into them. Mm -hmm. And there are knowledge skills, too. The general skills max out at 20 skill points investment when you unlock the last talent. Knowledge skills don't have talents associated with them, but there's no limit to how many skill points you can invest in them. So you can keep getting your knowledge bonuses higher and higher and higher. And this is a game where knowledge truly is power. Now you mentioned you mentioned knowledge being being power. How how does that represent itself in the mechanics? In the mechanics, for one, monsters. Uh, I any monster in the game can be made a dramatic difference in how easy it is to kill between if you know about what you're dealing with or what you don't know. If you have a party that's centric on roleplay, I have two different groups actually, one that's centered on roleplay but bad at combat, one that's centered on combat but bad at roleplay. Uh, I can take the exact same encounter for both groups. If the roleplay group just bum rushes into the cave having no idea what they're going in against, then odds are they're going to die and wipe really quickly. Mm. But if the combat group, they like to investigate the area. They like to have a knowledge jockey in the group who can make those really high monster checks. They can identify what monster they're fighting against, what are its strengths and weaknesses, what abilities it's going to use, what works against it, what doesn't. They can set up traps, attack it in its den, and know exactly what they're going into. And a fight that wiped the roleplay party for them, is a cakewalk. They walk right through it. And that applies in all aspects of the game between all of the different knowledge skills. So it, is, it a, is it a case where a, success, where a successful knowledge skill would be, uh, would be uh, against um, certain monster types would be able to provide buffs for the party? Not quite buffs, 
but just literally just knowledge. When you encounter any monster, you have no idea what you're fighting unless you can identify it. Ident monster tells you uh, some of its basic information and strengths and weaknesses, and the further you surpass that monster check DC, mm -hmm. then you get more knowledge about it. You can know its exact behavioral and attack patterns. You can know what skills and talents it has, and all the way up to knowing what is its current HP at the time you make the check. All right. And you meant you mentioned ha you mentioned having a having um having two playtest groups. Um Yes. With those playtest groups are you doing it are you doing it on the table the old fashioned way or are you doing it through a virtual tabletop? Uh we're using the table the old fashioned way. Right. Um fun fact though, I do have uh three test groups now. Um, so I have the roleplay group, who doesn't really focus on combat, but goddamn, do they make for a good story. The mm -hmm. combat group, who doesn't, uh, doesn't, who always needs a little bit of hand-holding to get through the story, but hot damn, do they min-max the shit out of life, and they make me, they let me test the hardest things in the game. Mm -hmm. And then I have a brand new noobs group, which is a whole group of players who have never played a tabletop in their lives, and a couple of them are completely unfamiliar unfamiliar with role playing games or even the fantasy genre as a whole and they've been playing the game and they've been giving me the uh the brand new how does a complete freshie handle this game experience all right now with the, with that kind of thing in mind some something that i found interesting when it came to when it came to weapons and how they operate in combat is the is the fact that you when it comes to the when it comes to the primary damage types you've set up a bit of a rock paper scissors relationship between weapons and armor yeah and, um wh how did what prompted what prompted that what what would you say you were kind of responding to with that sort of setup uh one part realism and one part uh balance because a lot of the inspiration for the combat systems in this game, and just how brutal and rough it can be, are inspired from just making a more realistic game. Mm -hmm. Like, one thing that I always, always uh, disliked about Dungeons & Dragons or Pathfinder was armor class, AC. You put on this really uh, good set of armor, your armor class goes up to 32, but that determines your chance to hit. And if somebody rolls a 31 versus your 32, then they miss their attack entirely, and that's how the armor works, and I don't like that. In this game, there's defense and armor separately. Defense is your chance to hit, armor directly acts as damage reduction, but in that more realistic sense, blunt weapons were created to ignore armor. Edged weapons, sharp weapons like swords uh, and whatnot, they were created to cut through people with ease. So, in this game, there are edged weapons that, on average, do a lot more damage than blunt weapons, but they're going to be blocked by armor. Blunt damage ignores armor, but they do significantly less damage. And then, for the sake of balance purposes, there's also crushing damage, mm -hmm. which sits in a, in a kind of happy middle between the two, where half the damage gets blocked by armor, but half the damage ignores it. And speaking, speaking of that kind of thing... When it comes to weapon skills, which I appreciate that we that that weapon use is a skill instead instead of just having its own separate mechanic, yeah. um, you have it divided between essentially light, medium, and heavy. Now, I have my own guesses as to as to what would qualify for each when it comes to melee. Um, but where do you have the dividing line between what counts as a light weapon, what counts as a medium weapon, and what counts as a heavy weapon? And... I have a kind of rule of thumb reference that I always use, mm -hmm. is that a light weapon are things like daggers, short swords, or light maces, something that extends about the length of your forearm. Standard weapons are things like your long swords and uh, your battle hammers, something that would extend the length of an entire arm. And heavy weapons are any sort of weapon where you need two hands to use this. And further, further in, further in that particular approach, where do where 
what's the dividing line that you have with exotic weapons? Like, what would cons what would be cons what would make a weapon be considered exotic in your rule set? So there are two classifications for or two things that make a weapon exotic. One is just one hundred percent region, uh, region dependent. The idea of mm -hmm. this weapon doesn't exist here normally, so most people don't know how to use that. A very simple example is a katana. I have all the stats and everything for a katana as an exotic weapon, because in my world of the lands of the Western Reaches, nobody has katanas, nobody uses katanas. These are an exotic weapon that nobody knows really how to properly use. Mm -hmm. But if you took that same weapon into an East Asian type area where they were very common, I would easily make them a standard weapon uh right out the gates, and they wouldn't have to be an exotic weapon. And the second classification for weapons are things where I just want to do weird stuff with it, in terms of numbers. You know, like, uh, there's the Bastard Sword. Mm -hmm. Something that isn't quite a heavy weapon, or isn't quite a standard weapon, or kind of falls into the category of both. And I also want to do weird stuff with its numbers, give it extra bonuses that you can't get anywhere else. Yeah. That's where exotic weapons also play in. Mm-hmm. Um... And when it comes in the in that now, when it comes to when it comes to ranged weapons, um, aside from aside from ammunition use, um, what so, what sort of other trade offs do do ranged weapons have as opposed to somebody who's going in melee? The trade offs for ranged weapons users is that they're. Damage output is oftentimes going to be relatively less. You know, the benefit of a melee weapons user is that they have their strength to rely on, mm -hmm. so they can just pick up a sword, and even if it's some damaged, shoddy sword, they can still deal damage based on, uh, based on their strength. Whereas bows, they can get really pricey, really expensive, crossbows, explosives, and... Their greatest strength is the fact that they are a ranged weapon that don't necessarily require strength. There are composite bows in the game that can give you extra damage for somebody that has higher strength, but as a rule of thumb, if you're somebody who has no strength at all, and you want to stay back, or you're the party healer and you just can't get into the fight, then ranged weapons have range. You don't have to get in the fight. You can stay back and still contribute a significant portion to combat. Mm -hmm. Now, in that, to further go on to that kind of thing, um, what sort of, what sort of, um, do you have any sort of rule set when it comes to, when it comes to the amount of time it takes to reload a ranged weapon? Depends on the ranged weapon and what assets you have equipped available to you. Mm -hmm. So there are quivers and bolt pouches. If you are drawing your ammo from a quiver or a bolt pouch, drawing that ammo is a free action, doesn't take anything. Uh, if you have a bow, you can load it into your bow as a free action. So you can just go ahead and fire the bow no problem. Mm -hmm. If you're using a crossbow, however, uh, crossbows are slow firing. You have to put the bolt into the crossbow, wind it back. So it takes a little bit more to be able to fire a crossbow instead. Mm -hmm. Which I've um I've never I've I've never used an old fashioned crossbow, but I have used a cr I have used a crank one and even that and even that's tricky. Yeah. And, um, I've only i I've only fired a comp I've only fired a composite bow once and <laughs> those that trying to draw that thing is a lot um a lot harder than it looks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And composite bows, you can get bow. They're, they're basically just the idea of having a long bow in this game mm. with just a much tighter, much tauter string. Yeah. Now, when a lot of um a lot of low fantasy settings will will have their will have their own non-standard approach when it comes to magic. And you already mentioned magic being being very limited and treated with a degree of super, a degree of um suspicion. So yeah. I want to get into the magic system that you have. Now, first off, I will give you props for not for not using the not using the spells the the Vancian spell slot approach cuz yeah. 
truth because truth be told, I'm not I'm not really sure if it would it would fit with what you're trying to do. And second, um I'd like you to go into the w the way um, your magic system is go is going to work. So the basics of it is that uh, spell components, somatic components, these are non-physical components. These mm -hmm. aren't um, things like uh, apples or lockets or anything you use. No, they are just the uh, movements of your body that you learn. As you play through the game, uh, you learn different somatics, different spell components, and you learn different path lines, which act as your elements. Mm -hmm. And as you play through the game and unlock all these spell components, you unlock a repertoire of different effects that you can add to a spell. Every single spell you cast is created from scratch on the moment. Does this spell activate on touch? Does this spell have 10 feet range, 30 feet range, 60 feet range? Does this spell deal damage? Does it buff the target? Does it debuff the target? And a lot more. Mm -hmm. And which path line, which element you use can also affect how these different somatic components change. And you can make a spell a lot more powerful by adding more somatic components to it, or even just boosting it with extra magic, even if it's a simple spell. But the cost to that is every single somatic component, every path line tier, and every uh, point of aether that you spend into the spell from your aether pool increases the amount of time it casts, takes to cast the spell. So the stronger your spell gets, the longer it's going to take to cast. And if that spell gets interrupted, it has the potential of completely blowing up your face or even killing you. Mm -hmm. Now... When it comes when it comes when it comes to the when it comes to the um, creation of it was was part of it just just on just not wanting to was part of the reason you went with this approach just not wanting to create a unified spell book in the traditional sense. Uh no, I was um, I, there is that element of it is I didn't like the idea of spell slots coming from Pathfinder and Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. But namely, the biggest inspiration for the spell system in this game is uh, Dragon's Dogma. I wanted a game where the most powerful spells are created by time. It takes more time to make the more powerful spells. Mm -hmm. And from there, it just ended up being a natural transition to go into having a spell system where you make each spell from scratch. And it also makes playing the spellcaster a super complicated really difficult but highly rewarding system where every single spell you cast exactly for the moment whatever the situation is exactly what you need yeah now when it when it comes to the advancements we talked we when it came to professions and advancements we talked a bit about gen about general versus focused and when it comes to the, when it comes to the spell system that you ha that you have set up here, um, does it le does it lean more, does it have that same kind of dichotomy of you can of you can either dip a little bit into multiple spheres or really focus in one sphere? Yes. So the spellcaster system, while you can pick any profession and any advancement, mm -hmm. the spellcaster advancements are the only ones that require you have the one and only spellcaster profession to start. The spellcaster profession, the acolyte, gives you access to your magic pool and uh, some different skill uh, bonuses, penalties, and talents to, uh, to go with that. And then there are currently in the game four different spellcaster advancements, each one focusing into their own area of being a knowledge jockey, a combat jockey, a general skills jockey, and more with special talents and abilities that make playing those playstyles a lot easier. But even if you pick up the spellcaster profession to give you access to that aether pool, mm -hmm. nothing locks you, nothing says you have to pick spellcaster advancements. You could still just as easily pick any other advancement if you figured that uh, your acolyte magic pool was enough. Mm-hmm. Now, I want to talk a bit about the alchemy system that you ha that you have because yeah. this uh, alchemy is is something that's certainly present in a variety of fa of fantasy games and um 
uh, and, and, and Pathfinder is certainly a is certainly a pioneer of bringing a full on alchemist class to the D twenty system because the the because um previously that was essentially a wizard kit in yeah. in a, in A D and D and. I um I don't remember a whole lot of people using it because there were way too many drawbacks for what it actually offered, and working working with item creation in in various versions of D and D has had its moments of jank. What was the inspiration for do, for doing a full on, completely defined alchemy system within War and Aether? do that why not and then from there it was just a matter of if i'm gonna do this though i want to do it right and for that the alchemy system is one i've been playing with since the beginning and have been trying to really just set it straight make it defined make it something that could really turn the tide of battle in any sort of way for somebody that really dives deep into it and make sure it was balanced and easy to use from the start mm-hmm and one of the things that I, that I noticed that step that definitely fits that um, that that user friendliness is the fact that components are are um are very. I realize this is a dirty word, but streamlined. You're yeah. not you're not yeah. gonna have to. But it's not but it's not overly streamlined. A, a case of overly streamlined would be would be the whole XGP worth of, worth of components that you see. Um, that you see the D twenty system proper utilize, or or yeah. the, or the or in some cases an XP penalty, which never made any damn sense to me. Yeah, whereas in this game you have general herbs and rare herbs and monster essences, which still simplify it and streamline it, but still complicated enough that you feel rewarded when you actually gather those materials together to make whatever potion, oil, poison, or bomb using the alchemy system. Yeah. And well, I I um I've I've had my fair share of ca of characters built solely around using bombs and usually the, usually the approach that I have is um you don't, the only formula you need to remember is p equals plenty. <laughs> Especially in especially in some cases where he where his where his um, solution to dealing with it, to dealing with a bu a bunch of kobolds is crates and crates and crates of landmines. Oh my god! Like two imagine t like two two dozen crates of landmines that that he that he whipped together with a with a bunch of imp with a bunch of improvised um explosions and alchemist fire. Oh my god. Because... And actually, um, that actually reminds me as well. Um, something that you uh, particularly might be interested mm -hmm. to know is that uh, soon, tentatively soon, um, I reckon in the next week or two, mm -hmm. I should have 0 0.3 available for the public early access of the tabletop book. Mm -hmm. And I'm also bringing changes to the bomb creation system specifically to streamline it a bit more and make it easier to use. And a little less shoppy as it is right now uh and 0 0.2 the way it is right now
your body. Oh <laughs> dear. And we're and okay. I can hear you now. All right. Sorry about that. Um, you were you were saying about um zero about zero point three, that the out that the current oh, yeah. setup is a bit shoppy. to publicly access soon. It's going to make it so all of the bomb materials that you yourself as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that was it. Just a little neat thing I want yeah. to throw in because we were talking about bombs. Mm -hmm. Is any anybody who want anybody who's probably doing a bomb focused build is probably is probably going to come up with custom custom explosions or for, or find ways to create to create you to create um non-standard approaches to trap making i hope so um that's uh for me that's the glory of tabletops is that level of creativity and i've i've mentioned the story a handful of times of the legend of the up button <laughs> The Legend of the Up Button. Yes, it is a run. It is a runic trap that I, a runic trap that I used for a rogue character a long time ago, where you st you step on the thing and you are immediately subject to a fly spell straight up for four seconds, at forty miles an hour. Oh my God! You know what that reminds me of is in Morrowind. There was very early on in the game, you happen across a wizard who just falls from the sky and they were trying to craft a uh, flight spell but mm -hmm. instead they end up making a super jump spell without a way to land yeah this is what this is why it's important to read the fine print in your spells otherwise your monster summoning will be summoning a block of cheese <laughs> uh. but now when now when it comes when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to the um the setting that you're going with this with this low fantasy affair, um, talk to me about the about the kind of world that the world of Zale is. It's a brutal one. Um, at the end of the day, the game is on the more difficult side. One where if you're not careful you will just die. Mm -hmm. But the world itself, I'd say the closest thing I can think of is vibes to The Witcher. You know, it's a very medieval landscape. Technology is low. Mm -hmm. Things have been affected in the world by the introduction of Aether and just the natural world that surrounds them. Uh, in cities, streets are lit up with rocks of glowstone lamps. There are magical potions and cures mm -hmm. that... I'm working on an official timeline to everything as well. At the, the time that the tabletop officially takes place in my world, it's one where the entirety of the Western Reaches continent is on the cusp of a uh, total war. One where they haven't quite declared war yet, but the entirety of the what's known as the Gratian Empire mm -hmm. is getting ready to go out and take over the rest of the country so that they can make themselves better. You, you, you know how empires do. Yeah, and when it comes to when it comes to that sort of an empire, um, what's what 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 analogy could could you use when it comes to medieval empires compared to this one? Because I can see, I can see multiple ways going about it. It could be one, it could be the more regional approach, or it could be the um, 
herd of cats that is the Holy Roman Empire? Um, it's hard to describe from real examples, as my world history is currently at this exact second failing me. <laughs> but uh, I would say it's it's akin to your classic empire. Mm -hmm. There is one main country, mainland, with a set with a central government around it. And then there are other countries as well who have their own rules, their own laws, and own customs. Mm -hmm. But those other countries are also under the banner of this central empire. They are extensions of that empire and extensions of their territory. I'd, I'd say, in, are we talking like satellite states? Uh, to a degree. Like there's the... Kind of thinking of it in the sen same sense of the United States, where there is the federal government that sprawls over everything, but also the state governments that also have their own rules, their own laws, under the tutelage of the greater federal government. Mm. Yeah, in, the, in, that re in that regard, uh, my comparison with the Holy Roman Empire isn't too far off, it's just that... There were a lot. There were a lot more states in that in that regard. Yeah. Um. You could, pro could probably use the uh, could probably use um, Austria Hungary as an exa as an example as well. Um. And given given the, given the, given that would it be fair would it be fair to say that um that skir that skirmish war skirmish battles between between fiefdoms or between countries is a little bit more common and a little bit of a easy way to get mercenary work as opposed to full on open warfare. Yeah, to a degree. Mercenary work is definitely something that the different countries do behind the scenes in secrecy to just kind of screw with each other. Well, like uh, force namely, bears? Yeah, namely like the empire the Gratian Empire versus any other country. Mm -hmm. But as uh, a general rule is right now at this at the time of the tabletop uh they haven't declared open war yet so they kind of keep those as more background dealings uh things to keep the other side from knowing what they're doing yeah. but generally when i run the tabletops when i run my games through what is, i consider like the official canon story it's during the tabletop that war is declared and the players either end up choosing a side or saying, fuck this shit, I'm out, and going to make their own adventure. And I could, and given, the, given that kind of setup, I could easily see whole campaigns just based around um, mercenary companies. You know, people who don't really have a side, aside, aside from whoever's paying me more gold. Yeah, theoretically, 100%. Um, and the other, that also brings, and given the given the ver given the various nations involved, one of the things I'm cu one of the things I'm curious about is um, is tra is travel between settlements fairly frequent, or is it one of those where anybody who has co anybody who has coin and has goods is probably going to be bringing in some degree some degree of armed escort? Uh, I'd say travel between settlements is pretty frequent. Mm -hmm. It's general, one hundred percent. If somebody has the money for hired guards, uh, they probably would bring it. As bandits and mercenaries are always going to be a threat in yeah. such a evil type world. But most people don't have that, and most bandits are either the type who are going to take every scrap from you they can and rob you for all your worth. Or they're going to recognize that you are worthless, you have nothing to take, and just let you go, as they wait for bigger fish to come down the yeah. road. Um, and the the that's part of the reason why I mentioned why I mentioned Corsair because the whole thing the whole thing with Corsairs during the Age of Pirates is is the is a deal of look we look we don't we don't approve of we don't approve of piracy, but if but if you um. If you happen to loot and plunder ships from th from this particular nation we're fighting with, we um we're not we're not going to we're not going to condone it, but um we're not but we're not going to we're not going to say that you did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of a similar idea between uh the Gratian Empire, uh, who's particularly at this time uh, at high tensions with the country of Alva. Mm-hmm. 
But that's yeah, that's in the greater story and in the greater world. Yeah. And in the tabletop itself, anybody can choose whether or not they want to play in the current world state, if they want to change the world state, or if they want to play, bring the tabletop rule system into their own custom world as well. Now, would it be fair of me to say that the setting you have is is human centric or or, or is there a, is there a demi human um, presence there is a demi human presence though it's a far reduced one humans are 100% the majority but this is a time where uh elves dwarves green skin orcs and red skin orcs those four races do exist but over the course of several centuries, they have been greatly diminished. The dwarves had a plague that targeted only them and made them infertile. The elves died due to cullings and war. And the orcs also su suffered a similar fate of just cullings from war and abuse from the human factions. And the humans who just end up going in and sweeping away all the other races while they're at their weakest. Yeah. Now... One of the things you pointed out in the Kickstarter page that I'm interested in is you want you wanted to give a bit give a bit of emphasis on me on doing your own spin on some of the more traditional um, monsters. Um, was when it was that something that just kind of happened as you as you were developing, or was that one of your um, goals early on? That was just something that happened as I was developing, like. When I was making monsters for the game, there's definitely the idea of I'm going to make a bunch of unique monsters, something that's just me, that this is what I want to make. But then there's also the fact that, well, there's going to be known creatures, you know, there are griffins, there are dragons, chimera, undead, and... I just wanted to put my own spin on them. Some things are just, they are what they are, dragons are what they are. But some creatures, I just wanted to make them a little bit more unique, a little bit more my style. And especially in combat, looking and comparing them to other creatures in the game, just thinking, what can I do to set this creature apart from other creatures? Mm -hmm. Instead of just being a bigger, badder version of whatever this monster is. And and um, obviously you br you bring up that some of them require silver to cut down so you def so that's another notch for the um witcher influence yep that's uh that's almost all monsters mm -hmm. almost all monsters require a special material to cut them down easily you can use silver uh, or steel it just does a lot less damage and silver is just the most common of the materials that work against monsters now with a lot of with a lot of the monster entries, I noticed that you have a um, a monster level and a th and a threat level. Um, yep. Is threat level similar to challenge rating in um, in D and D and Pathfinder? Kind of. Uh, one thing I did with creating the monsters in this game is that I want the entire world from the players, to the NPCs, to the monsters, to all be on the same playing field. So the monsters are created almost identically to how players and NPCs are created, with uh, the exception of specific monster abilities or monster traits that they may have. And threat level, to be perfectly honest, it's just the closest system I could make to represent how difficult this monster might be. There's no set challenge rating system where it's like, oh, this monster is CR3, where X party of X players will be able to handle this with Y difficulty. But threat level is the closest thing I could give to have a reference of how strong are the monsters compared to each other. You know, this monster is threat level one, this monster is threat level 20. This monster is level 1, but threat level 1. This monster is level 1, but threat level 6. Mm -hmm. So it's it's definitely not a perfect system, and it's one that requires experience in the game to really grasp your mind around. But honestly, I just, I just couldn't think of anything better. I couldn't think of a solid system to gauge how difficult things are, and that was the things I could come up with. But in that regard what 
what would it represent if the threat level is hi is higher or lower than its level? Uh, it's more dangerous, mm -hmm. significantly. The level, as a rule of thumb, I do think that a monster at level is something that uh, you can use to balance around a party encounter. A party of level 5 characters should be able to handle any level 5 monster. And then the threat level beyond that gives you a comparison of, okay, how dangerous, how strong, or how weak are these other level 5 monsters comparing to each other. But as a, gener as a rule of thumb, a party of whatever level players can handle the similar level monsters. Yeah. Now, since you mentioned that you're set that you're setting up uh, monsters and player characters to be on a on relatively the same plane when it comes when it comes to how their statistics are set up, um, do you intend to in a, in either a future update in the early access or in the full release put out a put out a um chap a, not a chapter but some sort of section dedicated to monster and NPC creation. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it should be in the book right now, actually, in 0 0.2. I do keep it, like, right at the very end of uh, the creature chapter. Mm -hmm. But uh, from there, yeah, it's something you can do right now. Yeah. I go through everything that... I use when I create my monsters. Mm -hmm. I take it through step by step. What's my process? What are the different special, unique monster talents uh, creatures can get? How it affects their strength and XP values. And from there, I think that reasonably, if somebody like took a monster I created and reverse engineered it, they could see exactly how I got why this monster is this strong, how is it worth this much XP, and where are its stats coming from. Mm -hmm. But all of that is currently in the book right now for anybody who wants to make their own custom monsters. And NPCs are literally exactly the same as making players. All They're right. all on the same playing field. All right, I got, I got you. Now, when it comes... When it comes to when it com when it comes to what's to com what's to um, come with it, um, first off, first off, what are you shoot what are you shooting for as far as a to as far as a total um, page count? Oh, I honestly, I'm not shooting for any number in particular. It's just however long it is, that's however long it is. I am going through a massive reformatting change to the entire book for the upcoming 0 0.3 update, mm -hmm. which is shrinking the number of pages significantly and making the whole thing a whole lot prettier and way easier to read. Mm -hmm. But as for a total page count, I'm not shooting for any specifics, just however long I feel it needs to be, that's what it's going to be. Whatever it takes for me to feel like I've gotten the information I needed across. Yep. Um. Now, in, now, first, now, first off, I do want to, I do want to give my congratulations to you for managing to get, managing to meet your initial um, goal. With... Yeah, uh, that just happened today. Mm -hmm. Um, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? As for a release window, I. To be 100% honest, my release window is September or sooner. Uh, preferably, I would like to have the book done sometime in the summer and then be working from there on how to get it published and get it out to all Kickstarter backers and everyone who supported the project. But Right now, what I'm working under is the time limit of my trademark. I put in a trademark for an intent to use, mm -hmm. and I have until September to use this trademark and use this book commercially. So, and I don't want to have to extend that trademark uh, application. I don't want to have to extend my time limit on it both for the sake of that will cost money that I don't need to spend, and also if I push it back even once, I feel like I could end up in a rut where I just keep pushing it back and pushing it back, 
And if I do it by this first deadline, that gives me a personal goal that I can set out and work towards. Mm. So I can't give any sort of exact date and not even an exact month on when the book will be done and when it will be going out. But as of right now, the project deadline is set for September 2021 or sooner. Oh, all right. And I'll I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how to seeing how it de how it develops with time. Yeah, and also um, until the project is done, for now I'm keeping it publicly available on early access. Anybody can hop into the book, and anyone can hop into play it. Mm -hmm. uh, I am currently trying to figure out where I'm going to link the Google Drive when the Kickstarter is over. If you head on the Kickstarter, you can just mm -hmm. go to the link for the book. I'll probably have the link up on uh, the Warren Aether uh, Twitter as well. But yeah, until the book is done, anybody can hop in, anybody can download it, anybody can playtest it, send me feedback. And then once the book is done and I'm actually like working on publishing it and I'm happy with where it's at, then I'll be uh, taking it down from there. All right. Now, take now um, with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. This this shit's, this shit's always fun, honestly. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Hell yeah. I 100% will take you up on that offer if and when the time comes. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.